who is this guy who is leading us today? So, hi, I'm John. Um, I'm the head of product operations at EasyVet, which is an, an IDEX company. Um, if you've never heard of EasyVet or IDEX, we are in the veterinary uh, software space. So we do veterinary practice software, but we also do diagnostic software as well. I've also been a lead facilitator at Colab now for a number of years. I've had over 15 years of experience in the technical as well as product leadership space. So a very long time ago, I did used to be an engineer. Um, I jokingly say that I'm probably a, a better product manager than an engineer, but I was a terrible engineer. So you can work that out for yourselves. I spent uh, quite a few years in the online gaming industry. So if anyone ever wants to talk about like, you know, video games and how horrid that development cycle is, you might have to buy me a drink first, but always happy to share some of those stories. Um, I spent a number of years at zero, so eight years at zero, uh, so building accounting software for small to medium businesses. And as I mentioned, I'm in the veterinary software space now. And I think that last point is probably the one that I take most pride in is that I'm very deeply invested in growing products, people. And uh, as I've spent a number of years now as lead facilitator at CoLab, I've had that opportunity to grow some really great product people. And I can see some returning people on the call as well. So um, if you've been in part of my cohorts and you're back, I'm going to take that that I did a good job that you've come back to listen to my voice even more. So let me just quickly get into um, a bit about CoLab. If you haven't heard about CoLab before, um, we are... We're, we're a company that is really passionate as well as growing product people. We really want to set people up with the right skills, with the right knowledge, and to really lead you and help you on that journey in product management. We run cohort-based learning. So what that means is that we don't just have you know, an hour webinar session like this where you're listening to somebody talk for you know three hours. It's a cohort-based learning so that there is content, we go through some instructor-led things, but then we have breakout sessions. We ensure that that cohort is actually communicating with each other, talking with each other, and building really good relationships. And we find cohort-based learning incredibly powerful because people get to build up those networks uh, from the first day that they take part in our cohorts. And if you look at our content, it's pretty much split up into these three channels. We have moving in, moving up and moving together. Moving in is very much about looking at those kind of you know, table stakes for product management. Um, I run the product fundamentals course for CoLab, which is part of our moving in channel. And that is very much setting up people with you know, the right skills for their first product management job. Now, we also do find that there'll be people that join our cohorts that haven't started a PM job and they really want to know what skills they need to get into that. But we also have people who have just started in their first PM role. And the question is normally like, I really don't know what I'm doing. I need some help, please. And this is where moving in is really great. Uh, moving up is that next step where we look at taking those basic skills and those fundamentals and really augmenting it with more you know, advanced and kind of senior skills. So that is looking at product strategy, which is definitely a very hard thing. Strategy in itself is, is a difficult thing to kind of, you know, muster particularly in an organization so moving up looks at you know product strategy how to accelerate your product skills and we also have a new course that we kicked off which was the equitable product and that is the fact that we actually start to look at people who are raising their hands ellie am i very quiet is that why you're raising your hands okay um just seen a message as well from Anna. So can you just give me one second and I'll do my best to make myself sound a heck of a lot better than what it is now. Right. How is that? Is that a better volume? All right. I'm not deafening anyone, am I? All right. Thank you, Ellie. If you can't tell, Ellie and I work together at EasyBet. So, you know, I'm quite surprised you didn't unmute and call me out. Um, so very quickly, yeah, moving up very much on the kind of, you know, the senior um, side of product management and then we have moving together where we want to get people together. We have events, we have meetups. We want to ensure that people within our collab community, which is over 500 people now, get to collaborate, talk, find opportunities as well. So that is collab in a nutshell. We really do hope that you will take us up on some of the uh, courses that I'll talk about at the end of this webinar.
But without further ado, let's actually get into the main content for today, and that is execution. So why is execution so important in product management? Well, I think for me and for many product managers, it is very much about that difference between execution of a thing and delivery of a thing. And I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about that. So if we think about delivery, delivery is very much about how we build that product up. It is about those capabilities and those requirements. And if we think about software, it's very much the technical side of things. So delivery is very much on the engineering side of the business, how we create it, how we build it, how we test it, how do we make sure that it is going to perform reliably. Now, that doesn't mean that product managers kind of, you know, hands off and don't think about delivery. We don't control delivery, but we need to be informed about it. We need to make sure that that team is on the right track. But even before we get into delivery, there is execution. And I think execution is probably one of the most important starting points for a product manager, particularly when you are kicking off a new product. It is about ensuring that people are aligned, that they understand where they're going, and to actually get people moving in the right direction. You know, I've got a recent story about this where we've had some work uh, internally to get done. And I think a lot of times people just think magically a new product is just going to start. Like a team just is going to form around a good idea and everyone is just going to be 100% aligned. But typically what happens is that people are always looking for direction. Your engineering team is looking for direction. Your, your testers, uh, your database people, your platform people are looking for that direction. And that is where product managers can bring that direction to actually get people to align on things, to understand, and then to execute. It is super important that we actually get started. That can sometimes be the hardest thing, particularly for new product managers, is normally that question, well, how do I start a thing? Like, I've got an idea, but... I can't really build that consensus and kind of people are going off in a thousand different directions and it, and it feels like I'm doing a lot of cat herding. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that we do do a lot of cat herding as product managers. To get into the execution phase of a product or a feature or whatever you're building is incredibly important. We can't just spin our wheels and not do anything. We are here to progress customer value. We're here to deliver that customer value, right? And we need to execute on it. And we need our teams to execute us, execute on it as well. So if we break that down into some of those areas that we really see people struggle with, particularly with execution, there are things like getting stuck in discovery. That is where we spend way too much time on trying to discover the right thing or the perfect thing. And we just go around in circles. We have a bit of an echo chamber where we actually don't know where we can actually start because maybe we haven't gotten all the data points that we need. We, we can also have an issue with very slow decision-making where people take a long time to make decisions because people are looking to make the perfect decision or the right decision at the right time. And quite often, perfect is the enemy of good here, where we need to make sure that we are starting off in the right place. We can also see a lack of strategy and metrics. Now, what that typically speaks to on that lack of strategy is that people can be, or teams can be incredibly tactical, where they are just doing things, right? But the tactical things have to follow a strategy. You need to make sure that you have a strategy that is setting you on a North Star or a projection of where you are going to go. And with strategy comes metrics, because as we all know, you don't know if you're doing a good thing or a bad thing if you can't measure it. Like, are we actually making a difference with this product or not? And then finally, the last two there is looking at a lack of team alignment. And that alignment can speak to where people don't understand where they actually need to be moving in the right direction. And that can be very frustrating for product managers. It can be very frustrating for engineering teams as well. Because to that point I made earlier around cat herding, people can go off in very different directions. They can misinterpret things. They can misunderstand things. They may not ask some of those deeper questions. 
And then that final point there is something that I do find incredibly difficult for myself, right, is ensuring that we have an up-to-date roadmap, that we have a clear roadmap, and that we're actually getting into planning phases so that people know the expectations and what needs to happen next. What are we working on now? What's going to happen next? What's later? Or maybe what's much later or things that we just won't do. We have to be very explicit about our road mapping. So let's dive into these five areas into a little more depth. So firstly, let's start with discovery to action. So we can find some of these symptoms that discovery can just last a long time. What is a long time? Well, sometimes discovery can last weeks, months. We can spend uh, a ton of time talking to customers or making sure that we've spoken to the right number of customers. That question comes up a lot for me where people will ask, well, how many customers should I survey when I do discovery? Or how many customers should I go and speak to about a certain new idea? And there isn't one particular number. I think that if you're going to talk to maybe five customers, maybe that's a little bit too much, too little. But if you're going to speak to like a hundred customers, that's a long time for you to kind of, you know, cat herd those customers as well and do that discovery. So we find that discovery can take weeks and can just linger. Teams get blocked. They just can't make that progress. And you know what happens with all of those team members is that frustration. Frustration starts to build. Why aren't we moving? Why aren't we doing this particular thing? And I think one of the things that will come out of this is that you know stakeholders will probably be the most frustrated. They'll say, hey, remember that thing that you pitched a couple of weeks ago? Like, what's going on with that? Like, oh, we're, we're still doing discovery. And their response will be, well, that was a month ago. Haven't you got enough data? Haven't you got enough things for actually, to us to actually move upon? So that discovery to action can be a major blocker to people moving forward. And I think Teresa Torres has got you know, a great, great quote here. Um, and if you haven't read any of Teresa Torres's book, highly recommend her as a product coach. She's written some amazing things on customer discovery and how to do continuous discovery as well. But for her, it's very much about looking, out, looking at those outcomes that we need to achieve. If you get anything out of this from discovery, it should be that we should be highlighting outcomes to achieve, uh, and then outputs. Outputs are just the things. They are just the features, the, the, the minutia of things. Let's really think about those outcomes that we need to achieve on behalf of our customers. So we need to ensure that we can time box our discovery. We can make sure that we're actually getting our team members closer in with that discovery process. Some issues that I've seen with discovery in the past is that product managers will do the discovery by themselves, or maybe they'll pull in a designer, or maybe if they're lucky enough, they'll have a BA. But the real value is when we start to bring in some of the engineering people as well, that they actually get closer to the customer. We move together. We actually start to do that discovery. Because when we don't do that, we don't work within those product trios of a product manager, a designer, and an engineering leader, we tend to get a lot of misunderstandings that happen. And that's a key thing because a message can be misinterpreted and it doesn't take long for a message to be misinterpreted where someone maybe will read a report or they'll read a transcript and they don't get the full context because they weren't in that interview. So as soon as we start to work in those product trios of a product manager, a designer, and your engineering leader, people then start to build that understanding and can actually feed off and collaborate really well. So I think some key takeaways from this to get out of this you know, endless discovery is to ensure that you are setting some deadlines. Now, I know as product managers, we don't particularly enjoy deadlines when they are dictated upon us. But when it comes to discovery, we should look at time boxing. We should look at saying, we are going to allocate two weeks to this particular discovery phase, or uh, maybe there's an exception and we will go you know, three weeks because we have to talk to customers across different time zones. But let's set some firm deadlines. Let's time box. Let's make sure that all of that information is current and that we can actually start to get some information and some insights from discovery to move forward. We should also break out 
of kind of our kind of sphere or our domain and look to see if we can leverage existing data, particularly in larger organizations. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of people that we can actually leverage in that discovery process. So if you, for instance, I'll give an example in the veterinary space, we have quite a lot of ex-vet nurses and vet techs that currently work for EasyVet. We can leverage those subject matter experts to be part of that discovery, to bounce those ideas off, to say, hey, I heard this thing from a customer and I don't particularly understand it. Or maybe can I bounce this off you? Are we on the right track? Does this ring true with you? Leverage existing data, leverage existing subject matter experts. We should also ensure that we are learning from real data. We should actually look at prototypes. We should ensure that as we're working in those product trios and bringing our designers into discovery phases, that we can create pretty simple wireframes to show you know, potential customers that we can actually see their response to it. Something that's so value, valuable is that instead of just talking about a particular idea, is to show people, to show people that wireframe. Because quite often when I've got into discovery calls, we will talk about a certain scenario and you'll get, you know, the customer or the potential customer would say, yeah, I, I think I kind of understand that. But as soon as a designer says, well, look, I have a wireframe. Let me actually show you what that workflow would look like. Their eyes light up and they go, oh, I didn't get that. I completely misunderstood it. Now I can actually see what that looks like. So let us learn from real data. Let's make sure that we can get some pretty simple prototypes. And the key thing at the bottom there is particularly from that Teresa Torres quote is to ensure that we are prioritizing outcomes over outputs. What is the outcome that we are trying to achieve from our discovery? If we are just looking to build a product with a set of features, that is not an outcome. We should say that our outcome is, for instance, we want to save our customers time. We want to save them additional you know, five minutes in their particular workflow or from whatever their baseline is at the moment. As soon as we start to talk in outcomes, that gives our engineering team that freedom to try and tackle that problem in a multitude of ways. But when we start to like, you know, just dictate all of those outputs of like, well, it needs to output to CSV and it needs to output to PDF and it needs to do this. It actually robs our engineering teams of being able to be those smart creative people and solve those problems. So let's highlight outcomes over outputs. And I think if you were to sum up all of these key takeaways, I think the thing that we need to think about as product managers is that perfect is the enemy of the good. Sometimes we can spend too long trying to find the perfect thing that our stakeholders will never kind of discriminate against or that they won't be able to push back. Let us make sure that we are looking at what is good that gets us moving forward. If we try and find perfect data, we're going to wait forever to try and find it. That leads us quite well into the next one, which is decision-making which can be a very tough thing for people. Because if you look at senior leaders, senior leaders really have one very important job to do. It's make decisions, yes or no. And we need to be able to present those decisions back to our, um, our leaders so they can actually inform people further up the chain. But decision-making as a product manager is also something incredibly important. We can't just go and feel alone to make decisions. We need to ensure that we are making decisions based on data, based on hypotheses that are rooted in some kind of data that would say, hey, we have a particular metric or a particular problem that we want to solve, and here's a potential solution that can actually move that forward. And what happens when decisions don't get made is that things get delayed, right? But you also increase the confusion and uncertainty across your team members as well as your stakeholders. And often, I think what holds a lot, uh, a lot of product managers back is that fear of making the wrong decision. That is going to happen a lot. We are probably going to fail 80% of the time and succeed 20% of the time. That should not hold us back on making decisions, particularly when we have very clear data staring us in the face to say that we shouldn't do a particular thing or we should do a particular thing. And I think this is best summed up 
by Scott McNeely. So Scott McNeely uh, was one of the senior leaders at Sun Microsystems for a very long time. If you haven't heard of Sun Microsystems, that's okay. I'm dating myself. They were the people that actually originally created the programming language uh, Java and then got consumed by Oracle, like a lot of other companies. But Scott McNeely had this great quote, and I'm pretty sure that you've probably heard this in some other context. But agree and commit, disagree and commit, or get out of the way. The key thing here is that he is saying, you've got to make a decision. There's a backstory to this, which is he had a senior leader who reported to him that just could not make a decision on a particular product. And he was like, I'm going to give him enough rope, enough rope to kind of make that decision. And that particular person just did not. So he brought him into the office and said, look, you got to make a decision. I don't care if it's the wrong decision, but you've got to make some decision to move us forward because we can't stay still. The market does not stay still. Our customers do not stay still. So we need to be moving. And even if we make a poor decision or a bad decision, sorry, we can learn from that. We probably learn more from our bad decisions than we do from our good decisions. And a poor decision is when we have made a decision not based on data, not based on anything, that it doesn't hold up to scrutiny when our stakeholders ask questions. And for some of you that have been product managers for, for a while or even starting out, you will know that your stakeholders can be incredibly difficult to manage. They'll be the first people to ask those hard questions. They'll be the first people to say, hey, I see a hole here. How are you going to kind of sort that out? So we need to ensure that we are making good decisions based on good data to move us forward. And some of the things that can help us make decisions and move us forward can be that we need to ensure that our teams, the people that we are working with, that is you know, our engineering teams, but also kind of um, other teams related to our teams that could be product marketing, that could be, maybe be our infrastructure teams, that they actually have full context of the customer problem. It is quite amazing to see how many times where people don't understand where decisions are being made or they, they lack the context of it, that it causes additional friction. It slows 100% down the entire progress that we're trying to make. So ensure that teams have full context of that problem. A trap that I see a lot of product managers falling into is that they just look at something and go, well, that's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious. I can see what that customer problem is. So I don't actually have to explain that to people. They'll get it right. But I'll tell you what, nine times out of 10, those other people have no idea around that context. They have not had that experience. They have not been close enough to the customer to actually understand that. And this is where I find a really good technique of repeating yourself works really well. For me particularly, it's called the law of seven. I think I've got to say something seven times for people to kind of remember that and actually sink that in. But make sure that you can tell people the full context. And it doesn't matter how many times you repeat yourself. Make sure your message is clear and consistent. But give people the full context. Get them to understand what the customer is going through. You know, it may seem pretty obvious to you, but it might not seem obvious to them. And clear decision making can also help when we have a framework that can be well communicated. Now, I know that there is like a new framework every single week, it seems, to make decisions or a new priority framework. But there's a lot of very simple things that we could use that help us to make some of those decisions. Even something as simple as using like a Moscow prioritization framework can really help us with those decisions that we start to categorize things as, well, we've identified these things as must-haves. We've identified these things as, you know, they sh we could have these things, or maybe we should have this, or we've categorized this as we won't have this. Use something simple to categorize your decision making, because if it isn't something that is something simple for people to understand, it is going to be thrown back. So make sure that we can have something that people well understand in that particular framework for us to make those decisions. When something is complicated or even a complicated framework, people switch off, right? Let's make it clear. It, it's almost like we actually need to inform people around those decisions as if they were five years old. Explain to me as I'm five years old so that I can fully understand this. You know, don't give me a lot of that jargon. Just be plain about it and have some candor. 
The other key point there that I think gets us out of that lack of making decisions is to ensure that we have a regular cadence of feedback and communication on how our team is performing. That can be in the form of things like a weekly status update. Now, I know a lot of us don't enjoy writing status updates, or maybe some of us do write, love uh, writing status updates, but having something regular as, hey, on a Friday afternoon, I'm going to go and send out an email or a, or a Slack message or something that informs people of our progress, informs people about our decisions. That really does help. If we are fearful that people are going to poke holes in our decisions, and if that causes us not to communicate and to just be very inward, that is going to be a detriment to your product. It's going to be a detriment to your customer. It's going to be a detriment to your team as well. So openly and explicitly communicate and be prepared for that pushback. Welcome that pushback as well, because that is going to make you better as a product manager. Better to have that pushback early on in a product life cycle than later on in a life cycle. Now, strategy and metrics or the lack thereof can also be something incredibly detrimental to, to not moving forward or not executing. If you don't have a clear strategy or simple, well-understood success metrics, it is so challenging for your product teams to execute quickly. Think about it like a, if you were to go on a vacation and if you just hit the road with no destination. Yes, that may sound fun, but sometimes some of us kind of want to know where we are getting to. How much petrol or how much electricity should I put in my car? I should have some planning for me to actually get there. And if we don't have a strategy or a plan for our teams, they are just going to aimlessly wander off in different directions. And this can be a, an issue for execution, but it can also be an issue later down the line when it derails things. If we don't have a simple, clear strategy, people do not know where we are going. And if we don't have success metrics that we can test to see that if we're on the right track or not, how will we ever know if we have made the wrong decision to move in the kind of wrong direction? This gets us into that place of saying, can we pivot or persevere on a particular issue in our product? We don't know if we don't have a metric. And now metrics don't need to be these horribly complicated things. Now, back into that first point around discovery, I think a lot of, of product managers can hold themselves back by trying to find the perfect metric or something that is just going to you know, solve world peace if I can figure out this particular metric. But often we need to draw a line in the sand. And uh, Paul Collick has a really good way of putting that. And they drew inspiration from the Lean Analytics book, which is sometimes when it comes down to a metric, we just need to draw a line in the sand. Pick a number. That might sound horribly unscientific. That might sound horribly unstructured. But honestly, as soon as we start to pick a number and a target and move towards it, we are very quickly going to know if that number is realistic or unrealistic. And metrics can be adjusted over time. So don't spend weeks and weeks and weeks trying to figure out the perfect metric. Andre, thank you so much for interrupting me. Please go ahead. Thanks, John. Sorry. I mean, you know my forte is interrupting, right? Um, no need to apologize. This is part of your brand, and I love it. All right. I'll put, I'll put it in my CV profile. Um, qualified interrupter. Um, hey, a quick question from real life. Uh, when, you, when you talked about setting an arbitrary metric and not spending ages on it. Um, so how do I actually articulate the fact that this is a good practice because I ran into a situation yeah. just about a week ago where we were defining metrics for a website feature. And I said, well, why don't we set something that will guide us? And I didn't get any buy and they just said, well, let's just set up all the analytics and figure it out once we launch. Look, I th you do get that, you do get that pushback. Um, and look, having analytics is a great thing, right? If we can have analytics that gives us that data, um, but you know, sometimes it's not just picking, you know, an arbitrary number or saying, Hey, we kind of want, you know, uh, I think 17,000 active users sounds pretty good on a site. So let's target that. It does need to be based in some kind of reality, 
But if we're looking at a metric that is, uh, we want, you know, 17.25% users per second or something. Jeez, how are you ever going to get to that on day one? You are probably going to have to do some work to actually figure out what type of traction that you have. So like, Absolutely great to have you know analytics and do some work to get there. And we definitely should have analytics in our tools and our products to figure things out. But sometimes when we start to look at our hypothesis, we need to think about, you know, what is that problem that we are trying to change or solve? And how do we know that we're going to be successful? There needs to be some kind of metric. So I think in in with the question that you had on, like, you know, this as a practice, I think. The, the kind of pushback or the, or the response that I would have to people is that, well, we don't have a number now. How do we get to that number? If we were to just you know, pick something that sounds a bit realistic, that gets us moving in the right direction, we can always adjust as soon as we progress. If we are holding ourselves back to try and build the perfect analytic solution or you know, it's going to take us three months to to sign that new relic agreement and get analytics in. Well, what are we doing in those three months? Nothing. I think we should probably set a bit of a line in the sand for us to move towards and be very open and honest with people to say, we might particularly be wrong here. And I think that is okay. It's probably okay for us to know what that number isn't and what it is. So I think there's a bit of candor that needs to go with that. I think I, th I think I think that comes down to having iterative delivery, and when there is a situation where you launch a web feature and you know you're not going to come back to it, potentially never. Um, I think that that's probably what drives the pushback about. Well, let's just look at the analytics because we're going to launch it anyway. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, look, that probably speaks to something else as well. Is that uh, you know sometimes we do have products that we're going to deliver a feature and never look at it again. We probably should. We probably should go look back on that. Um, and that should be built into our plan as well, is that after we've delivered a thing, can we measure it? Can we ensure that it is still performing the way that we think it is? So I think there's some follow-through actions that we need to have. Yeah, look, it is a tough position to be in. But I would say in Thanks, terms John. of our practice, some honesty is really good with people to say, hey, let us move forward. Let us pick a metric to be. Um, Thanks, John. Great question. Thank you. So, look, some of the key takeaways, and I've mentioned this before as well, is that you know having some a simple and a very consumable product strategy is incredibly important. So, what I mean by simple and consumable is that it should be well understood by like a five-year-old, right? But I know sometimes we get some very technical products that probably five-year-olds are not going to understand. But it should be easily consumable by your stakeholders by your team members and by other people and audience that you think is going to read it. As soon as we start to make something sound too complicated or too posh, if I had to use that word, I think people start to switch off. So let's make it clear. Let's make it simple. Let's make it understandable. As soon as it becomes kind of complex and complicated and something that is hard to read, people don't buy into that strategy. Make sure it is simple. Let's also make sure that your strategy is well communicated and have a cadence of that communication. Don't just think that when you've created a strategy and you've sent it out into the ether of your company Slack, that it is going to be consumed by everyone. It probably bears some repeating and it probably also needs to be quite realistic on that strategy as well. Now, when I say realistic, that doesn't mean that your strategy doesn't, can't be bold. I do think a product strategy does need to be bold. We want to solve problems for customers. We, we want to ensure that our products are compelling as well. So let's be bold with that strategy and base it in reality for, for us to actually achieve it. What we probably don't want to do is if you've, if you've ever looked at or heard of that company Theranos who did um, blood testing, they had you know, a strategy to do uh, a variety of blood tests on one drop of blood. Now that sounds great and that's pretty amazing. Was it realistic? Well, after a series of court cases, no, it wasn't realistic. So let's make sure that we keep it realistic but bold at the same time. Your strategy should also be created as a team sport, should be created by your team. It should be something that your team can well understand. A lot 
of product managers starting out and even some who have been established do fall into this trap of doing too many things on behalf of your team because maybe it's not fun or exciting to create a product strategy. But as soon as you as a product manager start to do everything for your team and construct the product strategy yourself, it becomes, you know, for an audience of one. Let's make sure that we can collaborate with our team. And that goes back into that earlier point around that disagree and commit. We as a team are not always going to agree on a certain thing. But if we set the expectation that people can disagree with that strategy, that they can voice their opinions, they can voice their concerns, but need to move in the same direction with the team. So disagree and commit. Your strategy should be created by your team as a team sport. It's also super valuable to connect your strategy back to your business goals. Now, a lot of people would read that and go, yeah, of course, duh, that sounds like just a simple thing. But a lot of product strategy is very disconnected from your business goals. And as soon as it is disconnected from the overall organization or business goals, it becomes super hard to pitch and sell that back to leadership particularly if your strategy is looking for additional investment uh, in a certain product area. As soon as it becomes disconnected from business goals, it's a hard, hard sell. So make sure that your strategy connects back to those business goals. If you don't know your business goals, ask what your business goals are. Maybe that is something that you know, your leaders should also be talking about seven times is to really talk about those business goals so that we can align and understand of where we're moving, which is an amazing segue into the next one is around team alignment. It is super hard when your team is not aligned on a particular problem to solve. When you get lack of buy-in, when people are unclear of their roles or unclear of that particular like customer frustration or friction, people switch off. And it is hard to turn that around. John Cutler had a recent post about this, which I think is really relevant, where he will say that, you know, alignment is overrated. Um, understanding and clarity is underrated. So we talk a lot about alignment. And we just think that alignment means that, oh, people can just move in the same direction. That's, that's particularly what they need to do. But if we don't think about the understanding side of it, people need to understand why they need to align. They also need to understand the customer problem of how we can move forward. So it's super important to, when we talk about team alignment, make sure that we are not discounting the importance of people understanding why they need to move in that direction. What is that customer problem that we're trying to solve? Repeat that customer problem. Make sure that people understand it, that they're invested in it as well. And they have the ability to push back that they have the ability to agree or disagree so that we can move together. And let's try and do that early on in our process. Let's shift that left, if you will, because as soon as we don't, if we have a lack of alignment or a lack of understanding, it is super expensive further down the line with your product. So your key takeaways here is that stakeholder engagement is key. I think you need to make sure that we have got our stakeholders on side that they can understand. They understand the customer problem. They can understand the strategy. And they also know what they can do to help unblock things and assist. Something like a RACI or a RASCI matrix is super important to have as well. That may sound like a bit of work to put in a matrix of you know who is responsible and accountable and who needs to support and who needs to be consulted, but it's a great investment because at least then we know who needs to do certain roles, who's going to be responsible for a thing, who needs to support this, and ultimately who needs to be informed of certain decisions as well. Regular demos and a review are great. So if you do not have an end of sprint review, I would highly recommend having it so that you can bring your stakeholders in, so that you can bring other people in to actually see the work that's being done. So they have the ability to have some feedback on it as well. As soon as we start to do things in isolation or we don't seek feedback from our stakeholders or from other subject matter experts in our organization, we may be missing something. So let's take the opportunity to have regular demos, regular reviews and socialize that. 
it might be that you can record that session and share it out. Make sure that people understand what your team is doing and how they are looking to accomplish their goals as well. Road mapping and planning is probably a really good lead into all of that, right? Because if we don't have clear plans and we can't easily communicate that, we are going to have a lack of execution. Your roadmap isn't just a set of cool things that we put into a sequential order. It is how we actually visualize our plans back to our stakeholders. It's how they know what is the next important thing, what's going to happen later, and what things we probably won't do as well. I highly recommend looking at anything that Roman Pitchley has written here on road mapping. He actually does some really good articles on this and actually has a very good um, outcomes-based or a goal-orientated roadmap. And when he talks about road mapping, he looks at it that, you know, your roadmap is very much your product strategy put into action. So you've worked on your product strategy, you know the direction that you need to move on. Okay, how do we actually execute on this now? How do, what do we execute on next? And what is coming later as well? So this is where we need to put our product strategy into action. And that starts to form our plan our plan of attack, our tactical way that we are going to start to get our engineering teams to deliver on all that value that we have in our roadmap in our strategy. So let's look at like a consistent and repeatable planning process as well. Don't just have one planning session, like one per quarter. Make sure that that's baked in. You know, a lot of teams now are doing things like weekly planning so that they are refreshing their plan, that they're able to course correct when new things come up. Another thing that's important is to ensure that all the tools that we use for road mapping to actually document things are easily accessible by our stakeholders. So don't just, you know, put it into, um, you know, a Confluence page that will go ahead and die somewhere. Make sure that it's easily accessible. Pin it to the top of your Slack channel, for instance. Make sure that you can communicate any updates that you're making to your roadmap as well. Your stakeholders will be the first people who will want to know any of those changes. And this may be some extra work, but it's incredibly beneficial to invest in engagement sessions and feedback on your roadmaps. Some organizations do something like, you know, a quarterly roadmap session where they get people uh, to kind of feedback into it. Maybe it's a town hall event, but something more regular, like we're going to talk about this as, as, you know, a monthly share where we're going to have engagement with people across the business to actually feedback on things. You'll be so surprised when you see how many different teams are either relying on your roadmap to succeed or need to feed into your roadmap. If I think about you know, a lot of organizations who have a partnership team, they're going to want to know about your roadmap. They're going to want to know what opportunities they need to go out to partners, get those deals signed, and how they can actually help progress your product strategy as well. So I think the, the key kind of roll-up takeaway here is communicate. Make sure that you are communicating with your stakeholders. Communicate with people who are interested in your roadmap. Communicate with your team as well on any changes. Don't leave people in the dark. Now, let's roll this all up into a bit of an action plan. So if you have ever had that experience of a lack of execution or really struggling with execution, there is a bit of an action plan that you can take to get you and your team moving out of being stuck in the mud. So I think doing something like conducting an execution audit is a good thing. If you have ever had an issue where you can't execute, maybe have a bit of a review, maybe have a retro. What's holding us back? Why aren't we moving forward? Uh, if it feels like we're getting stuck because we have a paralysis by analysis, for instance, let's do an audit. Let's be really honest about it and have some radical candor. You know, this is preventing us from moving forward. We should also collaboratively have a clear decision-making process. That doesn't have to be horribly complicated. It doesn't mean that someone has to have, you know, two copies of the key and you've got to turn it at the same time and you've got to go and sign a thousand documents and like phone the president. No, it just needs to be a very clear way of how you can make decisions. A lot of that looks like having things like a decision register. So when we make a decision, we are going to put that into a table. We had this particular problem. We made this decision. Here's why, and this was the date. 
And maybe over time, we can probably look at the outcome or the fallout from that decision and look back on it. So having just a very simple and clear decision-making process is key for this. Let's also make sure that we can prioritize and streamline the projects or the products that we are working on. So something like, you know, using a prioritize, very simple prioritization method like Moscow or an Eisenhower matrix gets us to really look at what the most important things are. Um, if those seem a little bit too basic for you, you could definitely look at something like rice where you can look at, you know, impact and effort. Um, I know recently Jira has just brought out Jira discovery, which has a really great matrix tool to actually compare your impact and effort. And then you can start to prioritize and see which are the most valuable things you should be working on first. Just remember that if we look at everything as important, nothing is important. So let's put some prioritization on things. And the last two there is very much around communication, right? Let's make sure that we can enhance our communication channels. Let's make sure that we are clear with our communication. Let's make sure that people know where to go, where they want to ask us questions. And a lot of organization that probably looks like having a help stack channel for your particular product so that people can come to you or have the ability to talk to the product manager. You know, don't put up walls to communication. Make sure that you can clearly and easily talk to people and be prepared for some of that pushback as well. And that last one is there to set up regular review meetings. So an event for that could typically be at the you know, end of a sprint. Have a sprint review. Get your stakeholders in. Get other people in for a demo to say, look, over the last week or two weeks or, or how, uh, how long your sprint is, this is the value. This is the work that we put in. And this is the investment. And we'd love to get your take on this and a, you know, questions and answers so that we can improve okay. our product. So just to, capital, just to recap on that, I think doing something like a, a, an execution audit is great. What are things blocking us at the moment? Because every organization is going to have some kind of FUD, right? That is going to hold us back. Make sure that we understand how we can make decisions and who needs to be informed about those decisions and how we can track those decisions over time. Let's make sure that we can always prioritize the most important thing at the right time. That's always the hardest thing for a product manager is to prioritize the most important thing. But going back to my earlier comments, that if we are spending forever trying to make the right decision or the perfect decision, instead of prioritizing, that is going to hold us back from execution and then later on delivery. Make sure you can communicate clearly as well. Get your message out there multiple times and make sure that you can have a two-way conversation with people as well. And lastly, set up those review sessions. Get people to look at what you're doing. Um, it's a time to brag about what your team has done to get some feedback and to ensure that people understand the problem that you are trying to solve. Now, I'm just going to pause there for a bit if anyone has any questions, because I know in like 45 minutes, that's a heck of a lot of content and a lot of this guy's voice. So I'd love to pause there to see if anyone has any questions about the things that I've covered. I don't mind awkward silence, by the way. We could keep going on this forever. But I do know that we have limited time in our lunch breaks. So I'll take that silence as compliance that all the content that I've covered here is absolutely amazing. Well done, John. So look, the last thing that, oh, thank you for the two thumbs up, Andre. I really appreciate that. Um, the last thing I will say is that if you are keen to take some of these things further, we have a number of cohorts that are coming up as well. So we have our product fundamentals course, which I'll be leading that is kicking off on March the 4th. We also have our advanced product management uh, cohort as well. That kicks off on the 26th of March. So if you've gone through a fundamentals course or if you have been established in a product management role for a while and you're looking for more, absolutely think that that is a great cohort for you to go on. We also have a leadership cohort that is kicking off in the next week or so. So that is very much around you know, product practitioners, how you can be a better product leader, but also how you can be a leader in your company as well. 
So all of these are cohort based. You don't just do it by yourself and you don't just hear someone talking, but you do it as part of a team and in a cohort um, as well. So I highly recommend it. If you have not signed up, please do. We would love to take you further into your product management career. And that gets me on to the absolute final thing is that does anyone have any questions at all from any of the content that I've covered, any of the upcoming uh, cohorts, or just anything in general? You can ask me anything. Again, look, silence is compliance. Look, I absolutely thank you so much for your time. Um, it has been great to kind of see the engagement here as well. We'd love to take you further, as I said, in your product management career. So if you are looking for any further updates on Colab, we have our LinkedIn site, which hopefully that's how you kind of came by and learned about this webinar. But we will have you know more webinars coming up in the next few weeks, more coming up in the next few months, and we will always keep you up to date on new cohorts launching as well. So again, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I really do hope you have a good rest of your day.